Welcome to Celebrating Act Two. And John Coleman and I get to speak with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet, who, by the way, um, when you finish watching this, go over to the johnmariani.com, his virtual gourmet newsletter. And it's chock full of interesting stuff, including his serialized no novel, Going Finding uh, Going Harry Lyon. Harry Lyon. Yeah. Okay, and it's a it's it's loosely based on the third man, and it just it's serialized, and you're going to have a lot of fun reading it because, in addition to being uh, an extraordinary uh, reviewer of fine foods and wines around the world, he's a terrific novelist, and this is one of his what's his third or fourth novel already, uh, John? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Imagine that a serialized novel free with every issue. Of the virtual gourmet. Man, live. Yeah, well, John, I'm a big fan. The, is that the um, none of these novels, which are the same two uh, detectives, so to speak, um, <clears throat> could exist because they do travel internationally, and only because of my own travel um, can I make it realistic. And that yeah. every single detail in all of these particular uh, crime novels is absolutely true including the personages, except for those I create, okay, which are probably in every, and it's interesting to say, probably in every novel of the maybe 20 characters, uh, I create maybe five or six of my own. And uh, there's always photographs of hotels and so on. Anyway, hotels, what is with hotels, dining they are They are a fun read, I'll say that. And, and I'm a big fan. I, I love uh, the articles you write every week. Recently, you wrote an article about the Martinique Hotel mm -hmm. uh, in New York City, and the, mm. I think it's the the Press Club is the name of the restaurant, a fine restaurant and a hotel. It brought up the question that I wanted to ask you, and that is, of course, you can always uh, expect a, a a good hotel to have a, a restaurant, yeah. but can yeah. you can you really count on the quality? just because it's a big hotel. Once upon a time, going back to, let's say, let's say post-prohibition. Well, actually, it's even interesting to go pre-prohibition. In the 19th century, all of the best restaurants were in hotels. There were famous places like the Parker House in, in, in Boston, the Brown in Louisville, the Roosevelt, Los Angeles. In New York, you had the Ritz and the Waldorf Astoria. That's where the best restaurants were. And they had French chefs, and they had, and during during Prohibition, um, when you couldn't serve any booze, when they built the Waldorf Astoria, they didn't leave any room for a wine cellar because you couldn't serve wine. So they had to add that after Prohibition was over. After Prohibition was over, these continued to be right through the war, um, the places to eat. In addition to the great nightclubs, now the food of the nightclubs like the Stork Club, Coconut Grove, um, Brown Derby, places uh, out there, um, the Hawaiian Room, uh, all of these places on the West Coast and Hollywood, the Hollywood hangouts, uh, the food was never the point. <clears throat> the menus were always exactly the same. It's sit them and serve them and get them out. You know, people were smoking and, and drinking. If you look, it's very interesting. If you look at Old photos from the 30s and 40s and into the 50s of Hollywood stars dining at, let's say, the store club. Um, there's almost never a wine glass at the table. Martini glasses, uh, old-fashioned glasses, yes, but almost nobody's drinking wine because they really didn't, didn't until the 1670s. Well, in the 60s and 70s, <clears throat> in the post-war period when Americans have lots of money and the middle class. I just read that the average middle class family as of like 1950s was doing very well on 3,000 bucks a year. 3,000 a year, which explains how my father could buy a uh, you know Chevrolet for 1,000 bucks back then, something like that. Um, so, but people were awash with money. GI Bill sent them to school. You could buy a nice little bungalow house out in Levittown. And they went out to dinner. And the higher you went with people who invented uh, the whole, whole idea of expense accounts and the diner's club card. Nothing was more important than the diner's club card. This guy came up with this idea. It's kind of like because certain restaurants had house accounts and you would go there 
five or six times a month, you know, and they'd always have your table. And then at the end of the month, they send you a bill and your secretary would pay it. Well, not everybody was allowed to have that. But if you had a diner's club, diner's club was guaranteeing that the restaurant would get paid and they would collect it from you. Well, that was enormous. And of course, that was followed by Amex and MasterCard and and, and all the other cards without which we cannot do. Is that, a, is that any I didn't, no, no dangling preposition there. Um, that changed it because now you did not have to pay, I mean, that you did not have to go to the restaurant in your hotel where you stayed, where you could easily put it on your hotel bill and hand it into the accountant. But now you could go outside. And restaurants responded with theme restaurants, of which uh, Disneyland out there in Anaheim was the progenitor. So you could dine in Snow White's castle in a castle. You could dine at uh, Davy Crockett's uh, 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 island and so forth and eat uh, American food there. And I mean, it was it was a wonderful, wonderful ideas that they had. Um, and that had a big, big influence on a company called Restaurant Associates, <clears throat> which opened up the Forum of the Twelve Caesars, which is Roman, and Fonda del Sol, which is Mexican. And the Four Seasons restaurant, which was one of the most beautiful of, uh, of its day. Um, and then Disney World, which opened in the 1970s, went even more extravagantly into um, theme restaurants. So in other words, dining rooms and hotels had become very dull places with very dull chefs. People didn't want to eat there. You don't want to stay in your hotel for five days and eat your meals there. You're probably going to have breakfast there anyway. And it's going to be too expensive. And the hotels were, as you said, they have to have them because they have to serve people breakfast, lunch, and dinner. This puts a strain on, especially if you had a union staff, which cost a fortune. And you cannot, I mean, you cannot make any money in a hotel dining room ever with a union. It's just impossible to do so. Where dishwashers get $26 an hour. Okay? It's, so it's just impossible. So what the ho hotels would do, or they started to do, say, hmm, why don't we hire under management contracts some celebrated chefs because their own dining room is not doing that well, or it's doing real well, but we, you know, we pay them a management contract and they will attract because they are celebrities. And John, I think you remember that you and your lovely wife and I ate when Wolfgang Puck for a time was at the Bel Air Hotel. Yeah. yeah. And we went elegant, beautiful hostesses and so forth. <clears throat> and the food served was good. Better than it, than it was when before he got there. But there was not the slightest evidence that uh, Wolfgang Puck was doing anything more than sending in some recipes and collecting a check at the end of the month. So sometimes that backfired, but it did not in uh, Las Vegas. Now, all the Las Vegas casinos have huge hotels. These days, they say that um, the profits from gaming are outweighed by food, beverage, and entertainment in Las Vegas. I guess that's true. I have to accept that that's true. Um, well, Las Vegas is a boom and bust town. If there's a convention in town, Las Vegas makes a lot of money. When there's not, they don't. Um, but in any case, they follow the Disney pattern. So if you go to um, uh, one of the any of the casinos there, which are often named after Egyptians, um, well, there's a, an Egyptian place and the, the Pari and so forth. So there will be an Eiffel Tower <laughs> right there, big life size Eiffel Tower. And below you will have little French bistros and so the Italian place is the same thing. Um, bring in Emerald Lagasse and do New Orleans type of, uh, of, of Creole food and, and Cajun food. Uh, bring in Valent uh, Piero Salvaggio to open the finest Valentino Le Cirque from New York. That's how the hotel dining rooms have bounced back. So that now this management contract idea, you mentioned I was writing about the Martinique. The Martinique Hotel in New York, it's uh, near Herald Square, goes back over 100 years and was once surrounded by, as you may recall, the New York Herald Tribune was there, the Journal American was there, not in the hotel, but in the surrounding area. The New York Times was there, and I think the Post was there. So you had all these newsmen, all these reporters going to the bar at the Martinique Hotel. Well, things changed radically. Those newspapers either went out of business, 
with the exception of the Times and the Post, are elsewhere. Um, and so they, they lost all that business. So the Martinique Hotel was just a nothing hotel. Um, you know, Herald Square could be quite, quite seedy around the, in the 10, 20 years ago. But now they've completely renovated the hotel and they brought in a first rate restaurant group who is running it. And they said, this is what, how we want our kitchen built. And this is how we want the bar to look. And this is how it's, and it's, it's a homage. It's called the um, a Press Club Restaurant um, in homage to those, um, uh, those newsmen who used to eat there. And so that they really, it really is a theme restaurant with sensationally good food because the uh, Franklin Becker was the chef I've known him for 20 years. He wouldn't do anything. And he says, let's bring back some of those old dishes. Let's bring back Crab Rangoon, which Trader Vic's, one of the original theme restaurants in San Francisco, in Oakland first. Um, Crab Rangoon. There was no such dish in Rangoon, but he brought it back, and it's really delicious now. He does Beef Wellington, an old classic favorite that you'd have in a buffet line in old days. He does Cherry's Jubilee. He does Baked Alaska, and it's all themed to kind of a madman era. So you get... You know, giant martini glasses, uh, excellent wine list, a lot of fun. The walls are just papered with uh, famous New Yorkers uh, upstairs and downstairs. So you walk into this place and you say, wow, this is this is amazing. This is what it must have been like back in the 1950s. Well, it's a lot nicer than it was in the 1950s. But that's <laughs> how uh, hotels have been transforming themselves. Um, Le, Le Cuckoo is one of the best French restaurants in New York. That's in a hotel. Jaleo is a hotel in the Bronx. That's one of the best uh, Latino. And there are many, many others. Uh, Michan George, uh, Von Gerichten is in the Trump uh, Tower, not the Trump Tower, the one in Columbus uh, Circle. Um, again, he, he doesn't want anything to do with Trump. It's just a management contract. Uh, Trump doesn't even own the building. Um, so uh, Daniel Ballou is in uh, hotels in uh, in uh, Palm Beach and so forth. So once you get these names, it's a it's a it's tricky because, uh, as I say, these chefs are not always there and their presence is not always palpable and it doesn't always work out. But if you have a hospitality group like the one one I mentioned at the uh, Martinique, um, what you're getting there is people who are there 24 hours a day. The owners um, who uh, make sure everything is right and a great chef. There's more and more and more of them all the time. But Great perspective on a uh, an industry because as consumers, you know, we we're not really aware of the quality of the food until after you go in and eat it. You know, so you're you're at the mercy of what the name, the advertising, and usually, but not always, a big hotel. You would expect to have the finest food. Well, they didn't need to for a long time, but now they're trying to be competitive again. And a lot of a lot of hotels, I should say, do not have the unions anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't even know. I, I know they have unions in Las Vegas, but I'm told by restaurateurs that they're very reasonable. They are in New York. No, that is no reason. <laughs> they would rather have 200 waiters out of work entirely than give in. Hmm. Well, anyway, John, so thank you. So. Uh, 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 well, I don't think there's a guidebook on name hotels with great restaurants. Uh, it it's probably not necessarily a safe bet, but at least it's it's coming back so that you've got a shot at having mm -hmm. a decent meal in a hotel where maybe you didn't have it 15 or 20 years ago. And from time to time, you'll find an article at johnmariani.com. The you virtual do. gourmet newsletter, and you'll see articles like the Martinique. Uh, so uh, let that be your guide until um, there's a book, maybe by John Mariani, on great hotels with fine food. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube. And tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.